the 113th Congress convening this month. We thought we'd take this opportunity on the communicators and look at their legislative agenda and the policy agenda of the Federal Communications Commission. Joining us are three reporters who cover technology policy. Gautam Nagesh of Congressional Quarterly. What's an issue that you see forthcoming in the next Congress? Well, I think cybersecurity remains the top priority because of its national security implications. We saw that Congress failed to reach an agreement on cybersecurity legislation in 2012, as perhaps many would have predicted. They remain very far apart because industry is very opposed to any sort of cybersecurity standards. That being said, the administration has threatened to implement a lot of their legislation via executive order, which sort of gives them the negotiating leverage. And we've also had reports, The Economist, which owns CQ, reported that President Obama issued a secret directive that addressed some of the collaboration between the administration and the private sector. So regardless, we will see more action on cybersecurity, I think, in the first half. Legislation still seems a very difficult proposition. We go back to that secret directive. Is, will that become public at some point or reviewed by Congress? Um, it's very difficult to say. As, as I said, it's not something that's been reported quite a bit. There was only a passing reference in the December 8th issue of The Economist, but essentially it addresses what is one of the most controversial aspects of the cybersecurity regime, which is how the government helps private sector companies, whether or not that is legal under current law, because there are you know rules against sharing information with the government from c private sector companies, especially regarding their clients. So again, there's very little is known about that. What we do know is that the government is very insistent that there need to be some sort of legislation or rules change that would enable some of the programs that already take place to do so under the law. Brendan Sasso is with The Hill. He covers technology for that publication. What's an issue that you wanted to bring up, Mr. Sasso? Uh, well, I'd say uh, net neutrality could be a big issue in the next year. Uh, the D.C. Circuit is currently considering Verizon's challenge uh, to the FCC's rules. And, uh, I mean, it's unclear exactly how the court is going to rule, but there are indications that on similar issues in the past that the D.C. Circuit's been skeptical of the FCC's authority. Uh, so if they strike down the rules, that sets the FCC back to square one, whether there'd be a push in Congress to, to enact a law for net neutrality uh, is a possibility, but I don't see the House Republicans going for it. So uh, that would send, put it all back up in the air and we'd, we'd be back to square one on, on net neutrality. So do you see that coming to Congress at some point or do you see the court actually making a decision? Uh, well, the court is going to make a decision, and uh, that could come early, early this year. And if they uphold the rules, then uh, then they're going to be they're going to be safe, and that's going to be the the standard now. Uh, if they strike them down, then it'll be whether Congress is going to try to act to to give the FCC explicit authority in this area. But again, as long as the Republicans control the House, uh, I don't see that happening. But the other issue is that uh, if the court does strike down the rules, it's even broader than just those regulations in particular, because it it puts the FCC's power to regulate the internet into question, and um, that's really the, the issue, the core of the issue here. So not just net neutrality, but any action on the data caps or, or other similar issues. It's whether the FCC has the power to regulate the, the main communications service of the 21st century, or whether, you know, is it become, gonna, going to become a sort of uh, outdated agency, like it would be regulating, you know, telegraphs or something when everyone else has moved on to a different communications service. Another technology reporter who covers Capitol Hill and the FCC is Eliza Krigman of Politico. Ms. Krigman, issue. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Peter. Um, I would agree with Brandon, actually. I think net neutrality is probably the biggest issue. When you look at the big picture, because it has to do with regulating the Internet, which is, of course, the most important platform in uh, communications right now. And I would add to his answer a little bit. I think the conventional wisdom is that the court is likely to strike it down. Uh, even the supporters of the rule are uncomfortable with the fact that the commission did not use what's known as Title II authority under the Communications Act to craft those regulations. They went with something uh, under Title I that they felt was weak um, under the law. And so they're very nervous about that. Of course, nobody has a crystal ball and knows exactly what will happen. So I think it is very likely that that question will go back to um, Congress. And as Brandon pointed out, it's unlikely that Republicans will go for it. But will Democrats make a big push? And another thing to consider about this issue is, will Google, as uh, one tech veteran said to me, 
provide the same role as corporate rabbi, if you will, uh, to guide this issue forward. If you recall several years ago, um, you know, they came up with a deal with Verizon. It was a top issue for them. A lot has changed for that company um, since that time and now they have a much more diverse portfolio of public policy issues to deal with. So I think it'll be very interesting to see who comes to the stage to, to make a play for net neutrality um, if the court does you know, strike down the rules? Well, speaking of issues that have been around for a while, um, there's talk potentially in the 113th of rewriting the Cable Act, of rewriting the Telecom Act from the 1990s. What kind of future do you see for those issues? There is a lot of talk, and there's been a lot of talk for about a decade. Uh, based on my reporting, I'm not personally uh, convinced that there's going to be any kind of major rewrite. And uh, I think it would be prudent to raise the point that one of the great champions for rewrite, Senator Jim DeMint, has stepped down, um, throwing a lot of questions into the arena about um, who is going to champion these, isu these issues and how in the next Congress. And I don't see an immediate uh, overwhelming appetite to dig in and do all of the tremendous work it would be for a rewrite. And I don't think that there's consensus on the Hill. Maybe there's consensus in the industry that there should be a rewrite, that a whole rewrite is the way to go. Uh, I think some members are more inclined to try and just deal with specific issues and think it might be just too difficult at this point. Um, one has to remember that that law really came from a 1934 communications law. Is it worth kind of digging into all the arcane past? So I think that's a big open question. You have to think about who's going to be in the, uh, the leadership spots with jurisdiction over these issues. Um, we'll likely have Senator John Thune as the ranking member of the Senate Commerce Committee um, in place of Jim DeMint. And it's not confirmed yet, uh, but uh, Senator Roger Wicker um, is likely to become the uh, ranking member of the uh, communications and internet panel. So, uh, and, you know, all those things have yet to be solidified, what they want to act on. So I think we have a big question mark hanging over that, but I would lean towards saying it's unlikely to see a huge rewrite. And I think the broader question with rewriting the Communications Act or the Cable Act is that we are in a period of great disruption in the communication services, and it really hasn't shaken out yet. Things like Netflix, uh, Apple, iTunes Store, tablet computers have dramatically changed the way we consume content. It is not yet clear how consumers prefer to get their content when all available options are there. And legislating in the middle of this sort of disruption, you run the risk that your legislation will quickly become obsolete, and it already tends to be behind the pace of technology. So I think lawmakers are fairly astute about the fact that legislation tends to lag behind technology. And they may give it some more time to shake out before they try to set these boundaries, which will effectively constrain innovation in some fashion. It's just how it's going to do it. Brendan Sasso, another issue. Um, well, the, the Google antitrust case, uh, we thought it, Leibowitz had been saying repeatedly that it was going to be FTC. done. From the FTC. Right, the, the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission had been saying for a long time that we'll get this done by the end of the year, we'll get it done by the end of the year, uh, and it's not done yet. So uh, it's now dragged into this year. Um, it seemed like, at the, it looked like the Federal Trade Commission was going to walk away without uh, taking any aggressive action against Google over the, the main issue, which is uh, search bias, whether Google prefers its own services and search results and whether that violates fair competition law. Um, but then, it, so it looked like that was where the Federal Trade Commission was going to go, but then uh, the European Commission, which was also investigating Google, looked like it was going to take more aggressive action, and it seems like uh, the Federal Trade Commission, sort of the last moment, decided, uh, well, maybe if the Google's going to have to play ball with the Europeans, maybe then we can extract similar concessions. Also, the, the state attorneys general were looking into it, and I think we're a bit upset that they've been sort of left out of these negotiations and we're pushing the FTC to, to be more aggressive. And so now it, it's now dragged into, into this year. And it seems it looked like, for a while, it looked like the Federal Trade Commission was going to take aggressive action. And then it looked like, oh, well, now they're not. And that seemed sort of the conventional wisdom. And now it, it again looks like maybe they'll be able to, to get some sort of concessions out of Google. Liza Craigman? Uh, I agree that's going to be a big issue. Um, I think another big issue is going to be implementing the incentive auctions to uh, create more spectrum. So the FCC has its uh, sleeves <coughs> rolled up and is in the midst of 
working on that. Some of the hot button issues on that are um, unlicensed spectrum, you know, that powers Wi-Fi and the other amazing devices that the tech sector is coming up with all the time. Um, and there's a real riff between uh, some of the Repub Republican lawmakers um, and the FCC over the appropriate way to create this unlicensed spectrum. You know, the conservative lawmakers are worried that they are going to create too much um, at the expense of money that could be brought in to help reduce the deficit and build out the National Public Safety Network. And uh, the FCC, of course, feels that its proposed plan uh, um, is good and that's go there's going to be enough money uh, for both. Uh, another big issue is whether or not AT&T or Verizon are going to be able to gobble up all of the, uh, the spectrum that comes to auction. So we'll be watching closely to see how the FCC formulates its policy to allow smaller players to get a piece of the action when it's finally you know, ready to do that. Gautam Nagesh. Yes, uh, on the topic of the Google antitrust suit, I think that that is perhaps the most watched by the commercial sector issue because it's really going to set the tone for the second term, how aggressive the Obama administration will choose to be on antitrust issues. They've just confirmed a new head of the antitrust division, Bill Baer, and we've yet to know what sort of tone. They've been very aggressive. They blocked the AT&T merger, the, the e-book settlement, several other technology cases. Um, Google's antitrust suit could, without risk of hyperbole, shape the landscape of the internet because if Google is not allowed to continue doing business as it ha does, um, it would change the understanding of the search mar market as it currently stands into sort of an uninterested arbiter of links. And Google doesn't see itself that way. It sees itself as an answers engine. It says essentially that they are offering consumers services they want. Um, once the government starts defining markets on the internet, then they become, again, you know, isolated and there will be rules to them and it will put barriers to entry for smaller companies. So it would have a far reaching impact if they were to find some sort of, um, take some sort of action on the core question that Brennan mentioned. What we saw, I think, was that a very sophisticated lobbying campaign by Google, I think, and outreach on both sides of the aisle really had an impact, I think, on how regulators viewed the core question. And then at the same time, we saw the fear on the regulators' part of being seen to be less powerful or, or achieving less than their European counterparts. So it's very, it, it, there's, a, it, there's a lot still up in the air. We don't know what's going to happen with that. As for the incentive auctions, I think that Eliza really hit on the two big points, which are unlicensed spectrum and limits on how much companies can buy. But we've also seen that the wireless market itself has changed, I think, since the Justice Department blocked the T-Mobile AT&T merger. T-Mobile has been re revitalized. They've shown some sign of growth. They have a lot of cash and spectrum now from AT&T as a result of the deal failing. And they are making some attempt to make inroads. They're building a 4G network, was not, which was not previously on the table for them. So they are attempting to compete as the nation's fourth wireless. And they have an impact on cost, because they offer lower cost plans. And then Sprint is under the process of being acquired by a very large and wealthy Japanese firm that would have the sorts of financial resources to compete with Verizon, AT&T, or Spectrum. That won't be done in time for this incentive auction, depending on the time frame. It but won't be done in time. We don't know exactly. Um, the incentive auction is supposed to take place, I think, in 2014. That might be tight for Clearwire, but these things tend to take longer than they're supposed to. Is there to any also. controversy about the Sprint, Clearwire, or SoftBank? Largely, they expect that deal to go through. I don't think there are many concerns about it. Um, Clearwire is a Japanese company. It's very large. Um, they don't have a controlling interest in any other major wireless firms. Um, so yeah, I, I have not heard major concerns. Not like, say, Huawei, or Hawaii. I don't know how to pronounce it. Huawei. Huawei. There you go. Thank you. The Chinese company that attempted inroads in the US market. Those sorts of concerns definitely are not at play. Well, I would just say that uh, AT&T has been raising some concerns. I don't know whether that'll gain any traction. And it sort of seems like they're still bitter because Sprint waged an all-out campaign against AT&T's attempt to buy DTT Mobile, even filed a separate antitrust lawsuit. Uh, so you know, if AT&T can cause some headaches for Sprint in this, for, to, for whether a foreign company is going to gain control of the telecommunications services, then I'm sure they'll take that opportunity to cause those headaches. It's worth noting that, for example, T-Mobile is owned by a foreign company, Deutsche Telekom. So it's not unprecedented for one of the major wireless carriers to be owned by a foreign-owned company. Right. Um, 
I would just add about the uh, spectrum. Uh, the other big issue is whether uh, Congress will push to free up uh, spectrum that's currently used by federal agencies. So that the that we haven't even held these uh, auctions of the of TV broadcast spectrum yet, and the wireless industry is always saying is already saying that it isn't going to be enough. We're still going to have the spectrum crunch. We still need more, uh, and a lot of the spectrum is currently used by the the Defense Department and other federal users, and obviously they're not in any hurry to to give that up. And so whether Congress will force them to, to move and how expensive that would be, I think is going to be an issue that will be taken up in this Congress. And I would add to that remark that we did see recently the House Chairman of the, um, the Defense Committee, I believe, um, come out and make a public remark about working with the Defense Department to clear up spectrum. And I think that was noteworthy because Previously, it's really been an issue just the Energy and Commerce Committee has dealt with, and I think it's a sign that they're making more of a comprehensive uh, push to pressure the Defense Department to find uh, you know, some airwaves that they can relinquish to the private sector. Go ahead, Gotham. I would just add, uh, I think spectrum uh, reallocation from the government to the private sector will be a priority in this coming year, especially Senator Thune offered an amendment to the defense authorization bill in December, which would have directed, I believe, the 1450 band of spectrum. I'm not, I'm not certain about that, but a band of spectrum uh, that is currently held by the Defense Department would have directed it to be freed up for commercial use. So he's shown that that's a priority for him. And the wireless companies are probably correct in the sense that the their appetite for spectrum will not be sated by this coming auction. Uh, it, it will be something like 500 megahertz at most, and that is really not in line with the growing appetite for mobile data consumption and video and all those sorts of things. So governments coming up with some sort of new plan. We've heard Lawrence Strickling and other administration officials talk about sharing um, spectrum, essentially, between the wireless companies in some fashion. So we will probably see more discussion of that. Brendan Sasso, uh, Eliza Krigman uh, mentioned some of the new leadership in the Senate. But in the 113th Congress, who are some of the new leaders in the House that we should keep an eye on? Uh -huh. um, well, I mean, a lot of the, I think a lot of the, the people are going to be, well, on the Judiciary Committee, we've got uh, Goodlot is going to be taking over. Uh, and Smith is going to be moving to the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, which actually has much less power than the Judiciary so Committee. So Bob Goodlatte of, of Virginia is That's going to right. be the new chair of, of the Judiciary. Judiciary Committee. Right. So, uh, and he was involved in the, the writing of SOPA, and so whether they're going to try to take up some sort of new copyright enforcement uh, is yet to be, to be seen. Do you see uh, SOPA, PIPA uh, policy proposal coming forward again? Uh, I, don't, I don't think that there's an appetite for the same fight over again. Whether there'll be some sort of effort to have some kind of enforcement of copyright rules online, uh, I think is a possibility. But um, I mean, I think a lot of lawmakers were a little frightened by how the, the SOPA fight went and the backlash to that. So uh, I think the, you know, the movie industry and the, the recording industry is kind of looking for maybe some smaller issues that they can, they can push. Now, um, Lee Terry is taking over a uh, for Cliff Stearns, correct, on the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, is that right? No, he is taking over the position that Mary Bono Mack had on the um, Commerce, Manufacturing, and Trade right. Subcommittee, um, and um, it is, and Marsha Blackburn, in, t in terms of new leadership position, is going to be the vice chair of the full Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, so it'll be interesting to see um, how and whether she tries to assert her authority in that new role. She has actually told me that she's interested in tackling something related to piracy, but I would agree with Brandon that um, it's, it's very unlikely. There, I mean, I, I think a broader, more important point of this discussion is that the ghost of the SOPA PIPA revolt haunts this Congress now, and all members are extremely wary of trying to enact law um, with technology they perhaps don't have an expertise on and don't understand all the ramifications. And I think that will be an issue. I hear again and again from various lobbyists every time they talk to a member and they propose something, they say, this isn't going to be like SOPA, is it? You know, <laughs> nobody wants, nobody's interested in having a, um, a repeat of that. So it's something to keep in mind. Well, Gotham to guess, what about changes, potential changes at the Federal Communications Commission? That's the big question, really. We've seen the commission is at full strength again after some time with the 
confirmation of both Republican Ajit Pai and Jessica Rosenworcel, the Democrat, everyone is waiting to see what Chairman Julius Janikowski chooses to do. There was widespread speculation that he would be leaving office near the end of the president's first term, having served a full term himself. However, those plans, you know, reportedly have been placed on hold. No one really knows what the chairman is choosing to do. It looks like he may stay for some time. I think it's fair to say his legacy is very uncertain at this point. Net neutrality was really supposed to be Chairman Janikowski's legacy, I think, when he came in. Uh, it has passed, but many of its the allies have either abandoned the commission in some fashion or are arguing that they didn't go far enough in the rules that they implemented. And also, those rules are on shaky legal ground. So as Eliza said, the betting odds are that they will not stand up to the challenge by the same court that threw out their previous rules. Reclassification is still an option. I would not be surprised if the rules were struck down if the FCC under Janikowski chose to reclassify still. Um, but regardless, I think Chairman Janikowski, what he chooses to do, and if he leaves, who the president chooses to appoint him will really define his the president's legacy on tech and telecom issues. I would just say that uh, reclassification would be a, a huge political fight because that's not just about, so the issue is you know whether net neutrality is sort of a small issue compared to the power of the FCC. If the FCC says that they reclassify what they consider the internet, they would now have the power to regulate it in the way that you know old telephone companies, you'd sort of set prices and it's much more, uh, much more control that the FCC would have and I think lawmakers would, uh, they would freak out over if the FCC tried to do that. And every hearing, basically, when they drag the commissioners before Congress, it comes even when that's not the subject of the hearing, it comes up. Well, what are you going to? Why is this? A, they still have the docket open. They haven't closed it. And they always, the Democrats usually say something like, "Well, we're still considering it. We haven't made any decisions." And the Republicans would like to to make a decision to to not reclassify it. Liza Craigman, it looked like you wanted to say something. Well, I, yeah, I would. Uh, I, I agree with that uh, assessment. And um, yes, I mean, Republicans in particular would go ballistic um, if they did that. But maybe if they feel that's their their best option, they would go far. It'll make great copy for us. Uh, um, but um, yeah, another issue that I think uh, will be big in the next Congress is the Internet Radio Fairness um, Act, and that is a bill aimed at. Uh, creating parity between webcasters like Pandora and the royalty rates they receive and the rest of the um, you know radio outlets they currently pay um, a higher rate and in the, in a few years I believe 2014 then independent royalty board will go through a process of devising um, the rates again so they're in a huge lobbying battle with like the recording industry um, Association of America to um, and, and other groups to uh, try and push this legislation forward, and they have interestingly have both um, Republican and Democrat champions um, of this measure in the House. But we're kind of at the beginning phase of the lobbying. They did hold a hearing over it during the lame duck period, and it'll be interesting to see um, how this plays out when more members get involved and not just those who um, you know drafted the legislation. Brendan Sasso. Uh, Senator Rockefeller introduced following Newtown a uh, violent video game review. Right. Will that get traction? Uh, I could see his bill passing because the, he introduced a bill that was just uh, requiring a study of the effect of, of violence in, in video games and TV and, and other media. Uh, so I, I could see that being something that gets sort of fast-tracked through. Whether there's actually any uh, action on it, I think, is probably less likely, and whether there's, and then whether any action would stand up in the courts is even less likely. Uh, the Supreme Court had a decision uh, in 2011, I think, where they they struck down California's uh, requirement that uh, the minors under 18 couldn't buy certain violent uh, video games, and that was kind of considered the 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 most likely to be able to stand up uh, in the courts, and that was struck down uh, as a violation of of free speech. Uh, so I'm not sure with with that decision. I'm not sure what uh, the court or what what Congress could do in terms of regulation of, of violence in the media. Gautam Nagas, we have three minutes left in this taping of the communicators, and the word privacy has not come up yet. Why not? Because while privacy will continue to be, I think, the largest issue for most internet companies, the likelihood of Congress doing anything on the topic, I think, is very small. 
Uh, we have seen the Federal Trade Commission has taken the lead on privacy issues, and they recently implemented new children's online privacy issues, which tech companies have are complaining about, saying they're quite onerous. But regardless, uh, passing privacy legislation, I think, is a bridge too far for this Congress, just because of the outcry it would create from companies like Google or Facebook or anyone else um, that collects personal information from consumers. I think we'll see administrative action. We'll see the Obama administration via the FTC keep implementing companies' privacy policies as de facto regulations. So companies will have to keep to their word, essentially, on, on privacy. And as we have seen with companies like Facebook and Instagram, when they change their word, there are enough people using them, and a lot of them are fairly savvy, and they pick up on these changes and what they mean. We see a public backlash, and then we see the companies often have to buckle and backtrack on some of these changes. That has moved much quicker than any regulation could. So for now, I think it's going to be status quo. We're going to keep having incidents that are going to outrage the public. There are going to be calls for action afterwards. But we're going to see the market correct itself, because I really don't think Washington moves quickly enough to respond to some of these concerns. Uh, well, I would say a do not track is one area that there might be some action. There had been it was sort of this voluntary talks. The advertising industry, there's a big event at the White House. The advertising industry promised to come to the table and work this out, and that totally fell apart and didn't happen. And so there were lawmakers and, and regulators, including uh, uh, Chairman Leibowitz of the FTC, that said they've been saying all of last year, well, we're going to give the industry a chance to, to try this on their own. And now that that seems that that's failed, there could be a, an effort to, to create an option where people could opt out of, of tracking online. Eliza Krigman? Yeah, I would agree with that, and uh, I also agree with Gotham that, in general, it's an area that's very difficult to legislate, and despite the fact that there's so much concern about it, I think a lot of members feel that the best thing they can do is kind of keep the pressure on industry and continue to make it a high-profile issue so that companies have to be on guard about this and push really hard for transpar transparency measures and um, simplification steps so that you don't have to sign a, an eight-page dense agreement. It's, very, it's easy for one to understand um, what information is being collected about them and, and where it's going. And unfortunately, we're out of time. Eliza Krigman covers technology for Politico. Gautam Nagesh is the editor of the Technology Executive Briefing for Congressional Quarterly. And Brendan Sasso is a technology reporter with The Hill Newspaper. Thank you all very much for being on the Thank you. Thanks for having Thank us. You.